Hello and welcome to today's webinar on SiteSpec rollouts. My name is Mike Fradkin and I'll be your host today. Before we get started, I just want to mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website as well as our YouTube channel at a later time. In addition, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to enter those in your question panel as we will be answering questions at the end of the session. With me today is our Director of Product Management, Paul Bernier. Paul's been with SiteSpec close to 10 years and has deep expertise not just in the area of product development uh, in the optimization space, but also as an optimization consultant working with companies to improve conversions and engagement on their digital properties. Hi, Paul. Hey, Mike. It's good to be here. Great. So just to give a high-level view of the SiteSpec platform and where rollouts fits in, we focus on these four areas of user experience optimization. There's AB and multivariate testing, which enables you to iterate, prioritize, and validate user experiences to drive higher conversions. Uh, then there's personalization, which enables you to personalize user experiences in a very granular fashion with machine learning and different targeting approaches. This again helps drive revenue and conversions, but also increases customer sat and uh, grow loyalty. As a subset of that personalization strategy, we also have recommendations, which uses artificial intelligence and uh, advanced algorithms to deliver well-timed user-specific product and content recommendations. And then finally, the focus of today's discussion, SiteSpec rollouts, which encompasses not just feature flagging and feature management, but also testing of full releases and advanced needs like platform migration, support of continuous release, vendor comparison testing, and all of the backend experimentation. So really a lot of power there, and we'll talk about all those use cases in a bit. Uh, it's important to note that you can select any or all of these, but all four are delivered via one platform. So there's one interface, one analytics and reporting vehicle. So it's really easy to add or subtract any of these, but you have a common platform. And so you can really get a holistic view of activity across all four uh, of these areas and the teams that are using them. So again, today our focus is rollouts, um, but we're certainly happy to answer any questions or follow up with you on any of these areas. So when we talk with our customers about the challenges they face and think about solution development around those challenges, we typically consider this phased yet repeating approach that they take with fine-tuning fine their user experience um, for their customers. And so I'm depicting the, this here with what we call the CX product lifecycle. And in these first two phases of ideation and prioritization, you know, the challenges are to validate ideas that work versus those that don't and do so quickly and cheaply. Um, and to, prior, you know, to prioritize winning ideas so that the changes that have the greatest impact are going to be brought to market, uh, you know, the quickest and brought to market first. So as I mentioned earlier, A-B testing is a really effective and cost-efficient way to do that. In the design and development phases, we're talking agile. You want to iterate based on frequent and granular feedback. And this is where SiteSpec rollouts start to offer a solution, enabling organizations to, you know, pilot prototype and target audiences at a granular uh, level. Then in the release phase, it's really about control and targeting. So this is where SiteSpec rollouts, often coupled with segmentation, enables the targeting of new features, um, you know, releases or next generation platforms to specific audiences. So you can, you know, pilot users for alpha and beta releases based on behavior, geography, user agent, time, a variety of other criteria. Basically showing new features and releases just to those who you want to choose them uh, to show them to and assessing the business and performance impact along the way. And so it's this recycle, you know, this, re this repeating uh, cycle of feedback, tweaking and iterating that really delivers speed and quality to product development efforts. And of course, you want to personalize uh, throughout that entire life cycle to really deliver more, you know, more catered and impactful user experiences. So to focus on rollout specifically, let's first take a look at how traditional full stack optimization works, or what you may have heard referred to as server side feature flagging or feature toggling. So keep me honest here, Paul, but almost every server side feature flag solution approaches this capability the same way. There is an SDK or a set of S, you know, APIs that developers have to write into their code. This calls out to a third party, and that establishes if they should turn a feature on or turn a feature off. Um, and so here we say you know, we've, we've got an audience here. The, the call comes to the origin. The call goes out to this third party, says, show this new feature. Um, you, you know, and, and, in, and then in another case, we say different audience, same thing happens, call out to the third party. We're going to say, in this case, you know, hide the new feature. Let's show them the legacy, the legacy experience and hide this feature. 
And so, you know, this is pretty traditional feature flagging, feature toggling, turn the feature on, turn the feature off, um, pretty traditional approach. However, this approach requires the developer to keep track of a lot of information about this user, about user behavior. It also causes a lot of code cleanup um, relative to building out these multiple experiences, um, having to manage these third-party SDKs and having to, you know, update them every time something changes in the stack. And so all of that work, you know, really becomes technical debt. And it's not trivial, especially for companies that are trying to, you know, test features at scale and who are trying to support or work towards this, you know, th this concept of continuous release. Um, but, you know, again, this is traditional feature flagging. It works for turning features on and off. It's a fairly common method. And SiteSpec has the same option available with our Engine API. For a more elegant and powerful way to do feature flagging and manage features and releases, however, we leverage SiteSpec's Proxly implementation. And this puts SiteSpec directly in the flow of traffic. And it's this piece that's patented and unique to SiteSpec. So this is how you do feature flagging with a proxy. Very similar concept, but with a proxy in the flow of traffic. And with this approach, and again, right now we're just talking about this one use case of feature flagging, feature toggling. We'll get to others in a minute. But with this approach, SiteSpec can tell you know, the web server right to do right from the first user request. We see everything in the flow of traffic. And so on first request, we already know a bunch about this user and about user information for targeting and personalization. And this, requ you know, this, this approach requires no third-party code, no SDKs. You don't need to code out every experience that you're going to be toggling between. And so that technical debt that I mentioned a minute ago is really greatly minimized. And this is sort of a huge yet quiet benefit because organizations are not always tracking the soft yet significant costs of all that code cleanup and management. And yet their developers spend gobs of time doing it without really any added value to their users or their products. Um, but again, this is just feature flagging. I'm now going to hand things off to Paul Bernier, who will talk about and demonstrate not just the feature flagging use case, but all the other power that comes along with site spec rollouts and this more elegant approach of sitting in the middle. Paul? All right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, just to be sure, can you see my screen here? Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Before I jump into a specific example of how we're going to have release a feature here in SiteSpec. I'm just going to take 30 seconds to go just through the UI at a high level, so we're a little bit more familiar with the different moving parts here. So when I log in, I'm on this dashboard. This page is meant to really give me an overview of my optimization program, of all the different rollouts and activities I have. Uh, I'll quickly go through. You'll hear me talk a lot about the concept of a campaign. A campaign uh, can be different things in the SiteSpec platform. It can be an A-B test, could be A-B-C-B. It's still the A-B type. Could be a multivariate test, in which case we're trying to test different combination of changes. Could be a recommendations product or content recommendations type campaign. Could be a personalization, which is about showing a certain experience to a certain group of users. Um, for this, these examples where we're going to go through how do we go about rolling out a feature, rolling out a release, rolling out an infrastructure change, I'm going to use the concept of an AV campaign. Back to the dashboard, quickly going through here, the alerts component is really important. SiteSpec is monitoring live the results of all these different campaigns, whether they're traditional AV tests or they're rollout specific or their personalization or whatever else you could do in our platform. And these alerts progress, pro progressively let you know in a proactive fashion uh, about the state of your campaign. These will detect issues, such as you have a campaign that's not getting any traffic, any data. You have a campaign that perhaps has a negative impact on an important business KPI. Uh, perhaps you've had a code release and that just broke a campaign. Uh, and then obviously you have the, the positive event. Hey, you have a campaign, it's winning, it's been running for a certain amount of time, it's having a positive impact on your business KPI and it's uh, statistically significant. So alerts are a really critical part when it comes to rollouts when you think about monitoring. The pipeline here is really just to show the various stages that our campaign can go through. Um, you can see how you sort of have all these different stages. You can have different users that participate at different steps, a user who builds, a user who approves before things go live, et cetera. Traffic is really just that, all of my app or web traffic going through the platform. And below here, we have campaigns that have reached a conclusion, positive or negative over time. All right. With that, let's jump to an example here. 
So we're going to look here at how would I go about releasing a new search algorithm. We're going to assume I'm in charge on the product side of things of the internal site searchability for our web app. Uh, I'm trying to improve our search algorithm. I want to increase click-through rates. I want to help users find really what they're looking for, and we're trying to get a new algorithm out. The way I'm going to approach this, I'm going to build an A-B campaign. The A is going to be today's search algorithm. B is going to be the one we're trying to roll out. This is going to allow us to really compare the new algorithm to the existing one with this A-B testing framework. That's how we really get a read on the impact. Are we, how are we impacting business KPIs as well as sort of technical performance indicators? Um, all right, this could be done by a product owner, product manager. It could be done by anyone on the engineering side of things as well, front-end developer, full-stack developer, et cetera. So it's a four-step process. You will see um, every time we go through these examples, I have general, I can define the campaign, the initiative I'm trying to do. I can describe the hypothesis of what I'm trying to go for here. Uh, I can tag or label my campaign so that I can create a knowledge base, easily find it after the fact. Step two, we're going to build our various experiences. In this case, it's going to be the different search algorithms. Uh, I'm going to select various metrics uh, that we want to measure the impact of this rollout on. And then if I want to target specific groups of users, I'll go, I'll, I'm going to use audiences for that. Right, so let's jump to the variation part here. Original is sort of our existing algorithm which perhaps is how I should have named this. And then we're, we're having that as our control versus the new algorithm. I'm going to launch a preview session here. This really allows me to see the experience the way an end users would see it. And what I'm going to do on our sandbox, search for phones, and I don't get any results. That's a problem. This website, this e-com site has plenty of phones. The problem is that our search algorithm doesn't actually search through category names. So I want to test a new search algorithm. I'm going to preview that now. Now I'm launching a preview session. Again, this allows me to really browse the entire web website, web app, uh, and see what this experience would be like for a user who would be exposed to that experience. Search for phones. Sure enough, I get a number of phones. Um, so what's happening here is that we're really using SiteSpec to trigger. Um, so hence the concept of more of a feature flag, if you will, trigger an experience that lives on the back end, on the server stack. Uh, if I look at my preview panel here, this gives me indications into what's what's happening with this preview session. What we've done is essentially set a flag on the request. User hits the search page. When, when that happens, site flags that request with a cookie value search equals B. And if I really simplify things, we've got on our server a code snippet that will look for these different values and will activate the proper search algorithm. I've got a really sort of simple example here, right? Um, simple sort of code block, retrieve the cookie value on the server, make a lookup on that. If the value is original, show the original search algorithm. If the algorithm is new, show the new one. This basic concept is really the, the idea when you hear feature flag, feature toggle, that's what we're talking about. Note here, there's no SDKs, no libraries loaded. There's no extra code to manage section. You'll see there's no code to manage metrics audiences. It all lives within our UI. It's very simplistic, minimalistic when it comes to the code deployment aspect of it. Okay. So how did I build this experience here? Um, let me open up my control here. So it's pretty straightforward, really. All I'm doing is setting a flag. I'm saying for the existing algorithm group, we're going to set this flag search equals default. I'm using a cookie. This could have been a header, could have been a query parameter. Uh, and then if we look at our new algorithm, all I'm doing is setting an alternate value. Let me just collapse this. Search equals B. All right, simple enough. You will notice these percentages here. What I'm doing is I'm doing a, a slow sort of progressive release. I'm starting with 90% of the traffic going to this existing algorithm and 10% going to the other one. I can easily change that split, custom split, change that any way you want. Um, and the general idea is that we start small, we monitor the results, make sure nothing's breaking, make sure we're not getting these alerts for KPIs having uh, underperforming or things of that nature. If we're feeling good, data is looking solid, we'll increase that percentage over time. All right, 
let's uh, just cycle through the other steps here. Um, this is all about building the experience. Step three, this is where I can select metrics to include in my campaign. I have a set of defaults here. You can see my buy indicator is my main KPI, and I have a number of uh, secondary metrics in here. Um, the way I've set this up is that I have default metrics. They always get included whenever I build a campaign. I can always include an additional sort of set of metrics uh, as I need to in here. Note that when we onboard you as a customer, our team will uh, build a, an initial collection of metrics. Uh, you know, we, we, we have a lot of consulting experience. We can recommend different metrics KPIs to build based on our experience working with a number of customers across different industries. So we'll build an initial library so you can hit the ground running on day one. And then lastly here, step four, I could launch this campaign, this rollout campaign as is, open to all traffic with this 90-10 split. I could say, you know what, we want to make sure that we target a specific geo, perhaps it's Europe or it's US. Let's say for this one, I want to target US traffic specifically um, and just start that way for this particular rollout. So um, Easily target based on uh, all these different audience criteria. You can see we have browsers, devices, I have geos, I have third party audiences, Adobe Audience Manager, Audience Stream, based off of cookie values, based off of data layers. There's a lot of pre built defaults. You can always build your own. There's a lot of rules in here, uh, but you can see how easily I can target an audience, how easily I can set this percentage split here with a click. Um, and off we go. And up here, when I'm, I'm, I'm good to go, you know, I can flip this campaign to be active running and we're going to start collecting data. All right, so now we're ready to look at the results. Let's just look at an example here. Uh, this has been collecting data for a while. I'm going to look at the impact of this rollout on all of my metrics. Uh, so in here, you can see I'm now on the analytics side of the campaign on the left blue nav. We were on the definition, we flipped to analytics. There's a number of reports. I have a chart here, a, a graph, a time trend sort of over time. And then below here, we have a table. Uh, my chart is really showing the impact of my, for me, most important for all e-com, I would argue, uh, the most important metric is purchase. I can see how uh, my new, uh, rollout experience is comparing to the original, to the control. We're having a positive experience overall. I can easily switch to all these other metrics we're looking at. Let's see how we're impacting add to car traffic overall. It's looking really positive. Uh, there's a couple other options I have here, here with this graph. And then below here, we have a table. This to sort of look at this more from a journey. How are we impacting multiple steps of the user experience? Horizontally, control group versus my new experience, the new rollout that's coming out. I can see impact on add to cart, purchase order value. Uh, whenever it's green, means, hey, this is positive. It's also a result you can trust. It's statistically significant. Uh, you can see how I can add in here additional indicators. And I can see uh, it's great. We're pushing more add to cart, more purchases. Uh, somehow we're having a negative impact on the quick view functionality also something that's statistically significant, but negative, and so on and so forth. There's more in here. I could apply segments. I could uh, have my top segments here. We have different views. I could create these different views, share them with the team, set defaults, et cetera. Uh, but I think that's a, it's a good place to start here. All right, so. so Paul, question for you. Uh Sorry, with, with all this data and the, the, the analytics and the data that you're showing here, is this stuff all easily exportable to other data systems, analytic systems if needed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can see right up here, I'll start with sort of the, 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 the basic concept. I have a data export. This will give me the raw data of the campaign, visit level, user level. You can decide that. And it has all of the metrics that we collect. Uh, we have users that will throw that in a Tableau or BI tool or, you know, data warehouse of your choice, really. Um, and then we have a whole list, let's see if I can find it here, of integrations. Uh, and this is just a subset of the most common ones, right, where we integrate with Adobe Analytics, uh, Google Analytics is here, there's a number of CDPs and DMPs, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's a lot in here in terms of integrations. This is something that works sort of behind the scene, set it up once, 
Uh, now you can leverage the data you have in these other tools. And because of our unique technology, because we sit in the flow of traffic, we're able to sort of augment the existing tags or the data layer so that we don't need an additional call to these different tools. Uh, so no additional costs. And more importantly, I would say, well, debatable if it's more important, equally important, uh, no data mismatch because we augment the existing calls. We don't generate any more. All right. Sure. Thanks. So we looked at um, really the concept of a feature, a feature that I'm uh, a feature that I'm rolling out. So let's um, let's look now at how we would go about doing a release testing. So in the concept of release testing, um, usually there's this idea of blue green and canary. These are two sort of approaches that are I would say commonly accepted out there. Blue green, traditionally speaking, is really this idea of um, blue is the, the the code base we have today, and green is the code base we want to migrate to tomorrow, right? So we're talking here. The context is uh, either you have an e-com site or a lead gen or finance or it's a web app. There's this concept of code release. You have these engineering is driving typically those, and there's a, a, a cadence. You be, it might be daily, it might be monthly, it's, it might be continuous. Uh, but it, it's always this concept of we're rolling out code and this may or may not have a good impact to our end users and to our business. Um, so the blue green is really you have two duplicates of the same code of the same infrastructure environment. You're running uh, the old code on one, the new code on the other one. You QA, you validate on on green, if you will. And when you feel comfortable, you switch over traffic. Um, this is risky because you don't really test the green, the new code release in production environment. You do everything you can before you get to a production environment, uh, but it's an approach that's out there. And then Canary is, is this idea that you release the new code base to a subset of your users so that you can progressively roll out, get an idea of how you're impacting them. You can choose to exclude sort of your more valuable or the bigger, uh, the bigger, group of your user base, you can choose to exclude those from your code release so that you minimize risk, you monitor, and you progressively expose these things to a bigger group. Um, so how do we approach approach this, this idea here of monitoring the impact of a release on business metrics and performance? The same idea we just went through with, with a rollout for a feature, how do we apply that to a code base so that we avoid this good old concept of push and pray. Let's just hope we don't break anything. And if we break something, let's roll back. How do we have a much more manageable and controlled process for that? So let's uh, look at how we tackle this in SiteSpec. So I'm using the same framework, same A-B testing approach. Uh, if I really simplify here, our A is going to be blue or old code base and B is going to be our new release. So this could be old code base. There you go. Um, and I'm leveraging the same general approach. The difference here is that the way I'm implement, implementing sort of these uh, changes is not with a feature flag per se. It's by pointing the user to a different host, a different origin. So what I'm doing here is that in my old code base group, this could be my blue group. Uh, we're pointing users to a different backend. This is going to be the, the server farm, if you will, or the infrastructure that will be the old code base. And then we're having a different host for our new um, our new code release here. So pointing them to a different origin. Note that you could implement this with a feature flag the way I did it earlier. That would require a code balancer and a whole lot more infrastructure. And it's important to understand here that when you when you think traditional feature flags, the ones that are API driven, uh, it's really features. It doesn't really allow you to get into this concept of the entire release. How do you wrap this up? So in this case, SiteSpec is sort of a smart traffic manager. We really point users to different origins and we control that. So everything we would just went through in terms of how do I control the split? How do I go with, let's start this at, I'm going to be, you know, much more conservative here, 95.5. I can easily do that here. There's no sort of let's go to the DevOps manager and let's go and tinker with uh, 
the load balancing, etc. It's all managed through this UI. Um, and that's one piece. The other one is, again, how can I measure impact on my business metrics? All these business KPIs are in here. In addition, I could go and say, hey, let's uh, see how we're impacting RUM, real user monitoring. How are we impacting time, load, page load time, time to render, and really any one of these core vitals or however you look at RUM in your organization, right? So you combine the business metrics, uh, the impact on business with the impact on performance. And uh, I, I don't know if I have JavaScript error tracking in here. Perhaps I have it in here, but I can really go JS errors. There you go. Beyond the just uh, impact on my main KPI, there's a lot here that goes into more risk mitigation. It's more about let's make sure we're not breaking anything than let's make sure we're having an amazing conversion rate. Uh, and then lastly, once again, in here I could say, um, hey, you know what? For this particular uh, release, we want to just target Europe because it's this particular um, AWS infrastructure in Europe. And uh, we want to, I'm going to have this here, perhaps exclude uh, our most valuable customers from this particular campaign, again, as an option to reduce risk. And once again, these audiences are all defined in this UI. Uh, the metrics are all defined in here. I don't need to have all this extra logic in my code base or in different parts of the infrastructure, all lives within the platform. Okay. Uh, just quickly, some other, I would say sort of goodies here that help with workflow in general. Um, so we've looked at how I can launch these preview sections. They allow me to really see the experience the way an end user would see it. Very, super valuable as a QA tool before anything goes live. Uh, I can share preview links here. Uh, this is linked to the original new release. I can send those by email and anyone can go in and check those experiences and uh, make sure that everything looks good. I have these additional preview QA settings. I can make sure that my audiences are all keying, uh, triggering the way the, I want them to trigger. I can spoof or emulate different user attributes, different user locations, browser types, um, users with different cookies so that I can make sure once again that my uh, different rollouts are behaving the way they should. And then lastly, as you scale up in terms of number of experiences that are running at any given time, there might be con conflicts. And so this tool here allows you to pick any number of concurrent sort of campaigns experiences. I wanna see how my product recommendations campaign is overlaying on top of this new release, make sure nothing breaks and make sure that this promo model we're running, uh, preview that all together, make sure that the new release, when I preview with these other changes, they all fits nicely together. So a lot of tools here that just help you really QA, mitigate risk, get comfortable and get buying before things go live. And when things are live, that's where we get on the results and uh, monitoring aspect here. And so keep me um, honest here, Paul. I mean, these are these are things that I mean, all, all this stuff that you've probably shown in the last five, 10 minutes, uh, you know, the audiences, the metrics and, and previewing and sending previews to other audiences and seeing how things all look with different campaigns. I mean, that's all stuff that would have to be custom built in sort of the traditional feature flag model or not even something you probably could do in some cases. That's exactly right. Uh, either you get really creative, right, with the tool and with other parts that you need to add to your infrastructure. Load balancing is the obvious one. Uh, or you just, you know, you, you do feature flag on one end and you, you handle this completely separate. Um, sure. There's one more here I want to show before we move on. It's this concept of how do I roll out an API? Um, so same general idea, except this, uh, the technology might be a little bit different here. But the, the scenario I'm going for is that uh, we have a, a web app and maybe it's a mobile app, it could be a web app, doesn't matter. And it's powered by APIs, uh, very common in the microservices sort of model nowadays, headless, et cetera. Um, we wanna roll out a new version of this API. So the technique I wanna show here is um, a little different than what we've looked at. So, so far we've looked at the concept of feature flags <clears throat> and this is doable here. I could very much set a feature flag so that my stack, my server would, uh, return sort of a different version of this API, and that's okay, but here's something that's a little different and gives you more flexibility. Uh, in this particular scenario, once again, I'm using the A-B testing sort of framework. That's how I can compare a version to another one, monitor and make sure that uh, data and results look good. 
I'm trying to roll out V4 of my API to day one V3. I have a group per, and I have a third group here, which is V4 with a quick fix. I'll show that in a second. Um, so what I'm going to do here is use the concept of a rewrite. A rewrite is the ability that SiteSpec has on the request path to rename a URL, to rewrite it. So the flow we're going for here is how do I rewrite sort of the V3 API on the request path to V4 before it even hits your stack? And that's uh, a really easy way to not have to implement sort of a code switch, code block, et cetera, um, and really just use the unique site spec technology to rewrite this on the request path. Um, so rewrites can be used, I would say, in a more traditional way for sending users to different pages using site spec, but you can definitely use them for this concept. Uh, for In this case, it's really sort of versioning. Uh, and this is a way that you can test things out, validate, iterate, and if you want to fully roll it out later, you can do that properly. And then um, as we roll out this new version, we realize that we have an issue, perhaps, and there's a bug within the V4 API. We want to just sort of quick fix the, the response that comes from the API. So what I'm doing here is the rewrite from V3 to V4. And in addition to that, I'm doing what SiteSpec calls a find and replace. Think of a code editor, a text editor. You find something in the page, you replace it with something different. I'm modifying here the JSON response. And I'm, all I'm doing is I'm fixing this entry here, replacing it with this one here, shopping root instead of subcat. Uh, and I can just change the content on the fly. This find and replace concept I can do on HTML, uh, HTML, text, uh, uh, um, XML, JSON, you name it. Uh, so very powerful. And in this case, allows us to sort of, again, be a little bit more agile, doesn't require a full release. Uh, ask your engineering to fix this box, fix this bug, wait a couple weeks for the release to go out, and then do this whole thing again. So uh, a lot of, I think, really unique, interesting capabilities here. And once again, I can preview, share these previews. I can set the split the way I want manually. I can capture all these different metrics. Uh, I can uh, pause, roll out, roll back, et cetera. All right. So Paul, we have a question actually that just came in. Um, the question it says, what, um, what issues or challenges should I consider when trying to use other feature flag tools for full releases? Um, other vendors have claimed I can do this. Yeah, so that's a good question. I'd say the, the piece that I would emphasize here is really the plumbing that goes beyond your simple code block. Uh, so if you think of a feature flag, there's this uh, concept I showed you know, earlier, sort of this general idea. Uh, that's one component. How do you toggle between different features? Then think about how are you going to target specific groups of users? Uh, how are you going to exclude maybe some audiences? How do you release this to just the West Coast? How do you measure all the impact on all of these different metrics that you have, which change over time? And in these traditional tools, these are things you'd have to implement within your code base. You know, additional coding logic to fire these metrics, additional coding logic to set a value and attribute to make sure that we don't fire this uh, code block uh, for these particular users. So it's just an additional layer of, I would say, plumbing in terms of coding, in terms of libraries that you really need to do beyond the really simple sort of if else that I'm doing here. So hopefully that gives a little bit more clarity. Yeah, so, and, I, so, and, and correct me here, if, I, so if I'm understanding you correctly, because I guess, I guess in addition to that stuff that you just mentioned, if I'm understanding this concept correctly, you know, we talk about the, the blue and the green, I mean, these could be, uh, they could be complete release candidates, you know, i.e. different sets of code. But I guess with site spec, you know, site spec sitting in the middle, they re the blue and the green could be really any two things. Um, it could be, you know, the same app on different infrastructure. It could be the same experience and functionality, but one being delivered via a single page app and one being legacy. Um, could be, you know, the blue could be uh, a monolithic app and the green could be the you know, same functionality being, you know, being delivered via a set of microservices, really kind of any two entities or two or more entities, I guess, if I'm looking at that correctly. Is that my understanding that correctly? 
Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So the the we sort of started with how do I get a feature released in a controlled manner? Then we moved to okay, let's go beyond just a simple change. Let's go to a whole slew of changes that happen to be bundled in a release. Uh, and now we look at how we can apply the same methodology, the same framework, the same controlled rollout for releasing changes to your infrastructure. Um, and I think you called out really good examples here. Uh, we're transitioning parts of our website from a, a sort of multi-page app to a single page app or a PWA. We see that a ton nowadays. How do I control that release and mitigate the risk? How do I make sure that we slowly get exposure to this new framework, um, monitor our business results, monitor our uh, performance metrics, and then increase traffic over time. How do we do the same thing for going from a legacy CMS to a headless CMS? How do we move from our on-prem data centers to a AWS public cloud or Azure or any one of these other public clouds? And, um, you know, other examples here would be moving from your sort of old app to microservices with APIs that drive everything. How, how do you apply the same methodology of controlled rollout a, B test, measure against your current state of things, make sure you're not breaking any one of the important pieces of the user journey, uh, and monitor your performance indicators all at once. So let's just look at how we tackle this. Um, by this time, this shouldn't be a huge surprise. I'm using the same AB builder. I'm using the same framework here, same course step process. Uh, describe what I'm trying to do. We're trying to do a platform migration. This is going to involve a couple of changes here uh, in terms of the, um, the product detail page is going to move away from a sort of uh, legacy CMS to a new headless CMS. We're, we're moving our checkout flow from the multi-page app to a single page app, and we're moving our infrastructure from on-prem to AWS. Now, granted, this example is a, a little bit extreme. That's a lot to tackle at once, but it, it really demonstrates sort of the flexibility and how you can really go here and take this to the next level. Um, so I've built my A versus B, legacy versus new platform. Legacy has these three changes here. And again, it's site spec sort of pointing the user to a different part of the infrastructure. We're using these host changes here. Uh, and so I'm using a trigger for this example. I'm saying, hey, when the user hits the product page, I'm defining that with a simple URL pattern. I could define that with any number of things. There's a lot in here in terms of how we define a particular part of the experience, but I'm using just a URL trigger. Um, whenever a user hits that, we're going to send that user to the this particular origin, which happens to be the legacy CMS. When a user that happens to be bucketed and the new platform experience hits the same page, we're going to send them to the headless origin, right? So we're doing sort of the smart traffic control here. When a user hits our checkout flow, in the legacy group, they're going to see the multi-page app. Here, they're going to see the single-page app. And this is all with sites like pointing the user to different parts of the infrastructure, uh, either in a targeted way with triggers or in a more sort of broad, uh, broad fashion. Once again, I have the same ability to really progressively roll this out. I'm starting with an 80-20 split. could start at any percentage split here, monitor, see how this is doing over time and roll out, roll back, pause the campaign if I need to, uh oh, we're seeing an issue. I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to pause this campaign. We're gonna troubleshoot, investigate, fix the issue, unpause and keep this going again. Um, same concept when it comes to these metrics, right? I can catch all these business indicators and my technical indicators as well. Same concept here where I can say, hey, I wanna exclude mobile to start with. Uh, and maybe there's a couple of old versions of Internet Explorers that we're not covering with this new stack, and I'm going to exclude that to uh, reduce the risk. And perhaps, once again, I want to target any specific geo audiences, for example, with your own. All right, so same framework. Once again, we're using that to a different level. We have customers using this in a CI CD environment to point users to different parts of these, uh, these sort of instances in a public cloud environment. So last step here, let's see, let's see the results of this campaign. It's going to be very similar to what we looked at earlier. I wanted to show how we sort of bridge the business results with more of the technical speed performance aspect. 
So I can see my new versus legacy platform over time, right? A-B testing methodology applied to a infrastructure change rollout. I can once again change these different metrics we're capturing. In here, I have my RUM indicators. I can see how we're impacting page load time over time. Uh, I can see how we're impacting time first by, by in, a, in a similar fashion. And uh, also, of course, the impact of my business indicators. So if I go to my table here, I have this one view really gives me a holistic understanding of impact on business KPIs. It sounds like we're doing a really good job here in terms of impact of business KPIs. And are we having an impact of speed? Uh, here I'm having an increase in page load time. Now that could be bad on the face of it, right? Our new infrastructure change is increasing average load time, uh, but it's having a, a really a big, it's cutting a really big chunk of time to interactive. And if you follow sort of the vitals and important RUM indicators here, how long does it take for end users to interface with your web app or your site is sort of critical. And perhaps that's the most important piece. So long story short, you know, you can really get beyond just understanding, uh, is this a win or a loss? You can really understand how you're impacting any part of the user experience, any sorts of segments of users, really dive, understand what's happening, control your rollout. Um, if you need to pause, if you need to roll back, you can do that with a click uh, and you get uh, a lot of flexibility that way and you control risk, you mitigate risk, you understand impact on your business. So this covers the different scenarios we wanted to go through for today. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly recap here and we're gonna take questions. So we started by sort of looking at the concept of feature flag in a traditional way um, and what this does and supports. And there's a value for feature flags. It's sort of a uh, API driven approach. You have a, a code block uh, that goes with it. Um, and that's great, and there's a value to that, and it's a good way to get started, and SiteSpec offers that. Um, it does have some limitations in that it doesn't necessarily do all of the user visit tracking for you. It doesn't necessarily give you a clean way. Uh, you need to include additional libraries. You need to handle all the metrics, all the targeting yourself with code. Uh, so these are things you don't get with a traditional feature flag that you get here with, with the SiteSpec approach. Uh, we minimize uh, technical depth over time by minimizing the amount of code you need to clean up later. You've, we've seen how we can use the SiteSpec uh, patented technology, by the way, to apply a change on an actual response from an API, which would be called a find and replace, really powerful uh, and really easy to implement. We've seen how we can take this whole concept to releasing a full release and measuring impact of your code release uh, on business and technical indicators. Same concept when we get into these infrastructure changes and we move to more of a CI CD continuous deployment, continuous integration workflow. Gotcha. So let me just, uh, and for those of you who joined late, feel free to enter any questions you have for Paul or myself um, in the question panel. I want to check, uh, we have a couple actually already already in queue. Uh, so let me see, let me read this one, pull up the question panel. Uh, so let's, let's interesting. So, so this one, uh, Paul says, I'm in our marketing group, but our product group asked me to check this out today. I assume they're considering site specs with some of these features. Can you tell me how this type of thing would help my team? Sure. Great. Uh, great question. So um, you could argue A-B testing traditionally has been a little bit more in the, a lot more on the marketing side, looking at how can we improve the experience to acquire users and perhaps engage with them. And then you have your product and development groups in charge of the features. And there's not necessarily, you know, a, a, a collaborative handoff that happens there. Um, so one piece that this does for you is that it really empowers you to have under one platform to run the entire program. It facilitates the ideation that perhaps starts on the marketing side and migrates to the product side of things. It's a way to prove things out. It improves collaboration across your teams. It's a really good way for a marketer to get a hypothesis. Uh, it's also just from how you instrument your team around this. You could have a marketer that structures sort of the AB framework, the AB testing framework, handoffs to more of the development team when it comes times to um, build the actual experiences that you want to go out, the features and the releases. 
Uh, and you can also collaborate on the results analysis and share of knowledge there. So there's a lot in terms of how you get the synergy uh, and you sort of uh, break the walls between the different parts of your organization. That's good stuff because you know I know Paul internally when we talk about site spec rollouts and sort of this you know tradition of server side testing you know we, we know it's a very sort of developer product manager centric product like this those those fits are sort of obvious but um, good stuff there for the marketer. Um, another question here said uh, I think I heard you mention that this allows an org to push bug fixes without coding. How is that possible? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that one, Mike? Yeah, it says, I think I heard you mention that this allows an org to push bug fixes without coding. How is that possible? Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, we get leverage for this quite a bit. Um, if you remember one of my examples, I had a, a quick sort of code fix for my API rollout. So the way that SiteSpec can sort of natively modify the response from the server means that we can effectively uh, augment your CMS capabilities. We can really easily fix a piece of JavaScript, fix a typo here, fix a message there. Uh, we can easily transition into personalization, but let's keep this to sort of the, the code fix, quick fix. You make the change with site spec, you can apply it to the entire user base outside of an A-B test, uh, and you can you know, take the time back to properly fix those things with a code release, et cetera, mitigate the issue really quickly with site spec. That's great. So I mean, that's 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 probably great for any sort of fix or feature that's going to be there just for a set amount of time, and it just allows probably less fire drills for the development team um, overall. I guess with that with that, uh, that sort of functionality. Have one here in the question panel. Uh, does using site spec rollouts effectively reduce the number of A/B tests that can be run at the same time? Um, so I'm trying to understand the context around this. Um, Short answer is that it doesn't. Uh, there's no, you know, really physical or technical limitations to the number of campaigns you can use. Um, if you remember somewhere in these scenarios, there was this concept of how we can see how different campaigns are overlapping. So we have this idea of a campaign can either be treated in sort of isolation. You, you split uh, your traffic through across a number of campaigns or you decide to overlay your campaigns. Uh, overlay is the term we use in our platform. <clears throat> so here I can really roll out, uh, I was going to say roll out my rollout campaigns. I can deploy all of my rollout campaigns so that they overlay with my regular A-B testing activities. You don't need to uh, split or stop segment your traffic. You, you can, and you may need to do, to, do so if you have a rollout that's affecting the same sort of area where you're trying to run an A-B test, right? That would possibly collide. This could be a good scenario for let's not overlap those. But when uh, you're having a, a general code release, that would happen anyway while you're doing your A-B testing activities. You can absolutely overlay those. So you don't, you're not limited in the number uh, that you can roll out. Hopefully that um, clarifies it. Okay. And, for, and for the person who uh, asked that question, if that if that didn't uh, answer, you know, please feel free to, to clarify, or we can certainly talk to you offline as well. Um, I have a couple more questions here, and, and time. Oh, that answered it. Thanks, Paul. Um, so a couple other questions here before we kind of wrap up. Um, and again, please feel free to enter any of the questions you have for Paul and myself. Um, one of the questions is, do you offer a, offer a trial of some sort? What's involved with getting? I can probably take this one. What's involved with getting this hooked up so we can play? Uh, play with this a bit and see how it works in our actual environment. Um, so I'll, I'll take that one, Paul. So yeah, I mean, yeah, in fact, considering some of the unique um, use cases that that Paul kind of talked about today, it's pretty. It's actually fairly common that conversations that we're having with organizations, you know, they're they're organizations that have kind of outgrown an existing solution, and they or they've come up against these sort of unique challenges that really only you know rollouts can solve. Um, a lot of times uh, we're having conversations with companies are so sort of beaten down by being told no or in their research finding out that they can't do what they're trying to achieve that they really kind of do need to kind of see it to believe it. So uh, long answer to a short question, but yes, we're happy to engage with customers on proof of concept engagement so they can kind of see how these things work and kind of put some of this unique power um, in, in play with some of their harder use cases. And so there's, there's a few ways we can do that, but I would just say, um, in short, you know, contact us, us and, and we can put rubber to road on making that happen. Uh, let's see what other questions we have here. Another one here. 
Uh, you, you may have already kind of touched on this, I think, earlier. Uh, this one said, we're, we're looking at launch darkly for feature flagging. Can you tell me how this differs from that? Sure. I think that um, that'll go back to really sort of the recap, the the entire sort of difference between the site spec approach and the platform versus your traditional feature flag. Um, launch darkly would probably fit on that first row here. I can't say that I'm an expert, but, you know, my understanding, and we've had uh, customers evaluating those. And uh, it's a API driven feature flag, uh, which means supports the concept of a code block, meaning you need to have engineering resources to enable that um, feature on and off on your server. So that that's the same across the board. The pieces where it differs is all the additional plumbing, all the metric collection, all the targeting, uh, you need a code, so that's more engineering release uh, resources, and you won't be able to do with a launch directly the, the full release, the full infrastructure change rollout without additional DevOps resources, plumbing, load balancing, etc. Gotcha. And I, I imagine most of the people on this call probably launch darkly um, just for 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 the audience sake is is sort of a, a feature flag kind of focused, right? Not client side you know, recommendations and other sort of user experience client side stuff, but sort of a feature flag only focus. Absolutely. Feature flag API driven. Gotcha. Um, I got, uh, we got time for a few more questions, but I only have one here left in queue. This one said, um, you mentioned some of your, your customers are using help with this platform migration use case. Uh, I know you're not able to mention specific company names, but can you give a few specific examples of migrations and how site spec was used? Sure. Um, so they, I think the ones that come to mind are similar to examples I went through. Um, things we, we see quite a bit, I'd say, the themes are migrating from a legacy uh, infrastructure on-premise servers to a public infrastructure. And the other one is around single page apps. So uh, we've definitely had, I'm thinking of a large e-com uh, customer of ours using SiteSpec to really manage the entire process of going from on-prem to AWS. Uh, it involves a whole series of A-B tests where it's um, always sending a small portion of traffic to the new infrastructure, in this case, AWS, monitor against the A-B tests and monitor against the current infrastructure. Um, this was sort of a slow, long process where there's a lot that you uncover where you change you know, that big of a change impacts a lot of things across the board. Uh, and so a lot of iterations of A-B tests, pause, learn what the issue is, investigate, troubleshoot, do another one, slow rollout monitor, et cetera. The, a lot of what we've seen today. Um, the other one is the uh, releasing part of the website under a new single page app. Either it's an old Angular to the new React or traditional HTML to React. We see a lot of those. and. One in particular that I think about was in the checkout flow. Checkout flow is, you could argue, one of the most critical part of the user journey. You've invested a ton to get acquired customers, to engage them. They're willing to sort of purchase. You don't want to break things up at that point for them. You don't want to put any sorts of restrictions. Um, and so same idea, really slow, progressive rollout, super targeted in the checkout flow. Uh, Initial, initially came up issues with actually having a negative impact on overall checkout conversion flow. Fix issues, iterate a lot, and then you know fully release the entire framework. Yeah, those are great examples. Thanks, Paul. Um, so that's it. I don't have any more questions. I just want to thank you all for joining us today. If you have additional questions or want any further information about SiteSpec rollouts or the other products that I covered earlier, SiteSpec in general, um, you know, please feel free to email us at info at sitespec.com. Or to see more about rollouts specifically, you can visit www.sitespec.com backslash rollouts.